um, I feel like it's like the, the, the world of AI um, accelerates in summer. Um, and so many blockbusters uh, from the big companies that came out this month that we're going to talk about that. It's exponential, um, right? So it, it accelerates every month. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yep, yep. And um, all right, so let's let's start with a, a few words uh, from you, Jakub. Where, where are you joining us from, actually? Hi, my, so my name is Jakub Severo. Uh, I'm uh, the founder of Zeta Alpha. Uh, been in AI for uh, ages, since the early 90s. Very excited about the progress. It's exponential, so accelerating every month. And um, this was a very, uh, yeah, very special month. Lots of cool stuff coming out that we're going to talk about. And uh, from the sort of uh, stylish plywood uh, background that I have, some of you might be able to guess where I am. Uh, I'm at the University of Amsterdam Science Park, uh, where we started with Zeta Alpha and where we're soon moving back and where, which is kind of the, the center of the Dutch AI universe and um, a big AI hub uh, in, uh, in Europe with many. And we're now celebrating uh, three years. So that's- uh, we're celebrating three years of Zeta Alpha, yeah. That's very uh, cool, my son. Yeah, so my name is Sergi Castella. Um, I'm the AI community uh, manager at Zeta Alpha, and I try to stay up to date with what's happening in the world of, of artificial intelligence um, and organize also um, these, these sort of uh, monthly webinars. Um, I'm joining from the, from the headquarters of Zeta Alpha. I think that uh, not for too long, like Jakob said, because we're probably going to move back to Science Park, which is super exciting. Um, but yeah, let's uh, jump right into, into it, right? Uh, we can start with some news that I know Jakob, you always talk about that. Yeah, Yeah. so um, just some uh, TechCrunch uh, news uh, review on the main headlines uh, in AI. Um, so uh, obviously economy is cooling down, but uh, uh, a little more than two weeks ago, uh, the Israeli uh, startup Metropolis, which is doing... Um, uh, computer vision and other AI for uh, parking garages. <laughs> Who would have thought that was a really like a, a hot niche? So they recognize your car when you come in and uh, you automatically uh, pay without any sort of uh, hassles. And um, they got the somewhat astronomical uh, amount of funding of $167 million. Um, and I just have a kind of feeling that's that's one of the last astronomical tickets that's going to be uh, written uh, uh, this year but who knows we we've seen a few bigger ones and um, um, there's still a lot of uh, capital in in the venture scene mm -hmm. and um, um, you know that AI has come to the mainstream when IKEA is rolling out their AI apps <laughs> so uh, uh, they have this sort of um, very nice uh, simulator, AI-powered simulator, where you can design your room with uh, all kinds of cool artificial uh, uh, um, uh, augmented reality uh, type of stuff. So um, uh, we've talked about Cohere before. It's a very cool uh, startup uh, in the large language model space. Uh, they have launched their... Um, Sort of research side, so a nonprofit uh, research lab headed by um, uh, Sarah Hooker, uh, formerly from Google. Um, exciting! What what will come out of that? Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, I think if one company has co-pilot, all companies need co-pilot. So Amazon uh, <laughs> is uh, uh, launching their um, AI programming tool. Um, and um, it's called Code Whisperer. I don't know what that means about the soul of the average programmer, but they need something <laughs> to do, maybe. I know that that's super interesting. I mean, I, I've heard a lot of um, a good feedback from from friends who are using Copilot, and they say that it's actually spookily good and spookily useful. Um, and I think it's super interesting to see how, you know, it, it wasn't that long. I mean, the GPT three was, uh, I would say, like a big, um, you know, turning point in for big language models. Um, in terms of like being applied to all of these consumer products. And two years later, we already have, you know, um, two big uh, players working on, you know, having a, a pretty successful product based on that. It's GPT-3 plus machine translation into Python or whatever your language is. And uh, actually, uh, uh, Copilot has been, uh, uh, has been making the rounds for a while now already. 
uh, but actually right now is generally available. So any developer can uh, plug it into their um, development environment. I think they're probably kind of Microsoft-ish, so uh, Visual Studio. Or yeah, whatever. Visual Studio has very good integration with that, yeah. Yeah, and I just read this very scary stat. So 1.2 million already signed up during the preview period. This is before it was generally available. And now 40% of the newly written code in, I don't know, GitHub or uh, Visual <laughs> Studio or somewhere, I'm not sure what they counted, uh, is written by Copilot. Well, that's that's that's, that's a good boost for productivity. Hopefully, hopefully, under very strict supervision of humans. Uh, what about, <laughs> what, who who says humans don't make bugs? It's uh, yeah. error is human. To be perfect is the machine. Uh. <laughs> All right. Um, what else? Um, so, go to the next slide. Well, this is a bit of old news, really, for everybody who's in the know. Uh, but now even Business Insider, which is not really an AI uh, publication, uh, got noticed that, um, and, and it's kind of official now that Google has ditched uh, the future of TensorFlow. I mean, there's still a lot of TensorFlow, uh, but more or less PyTorch has won over TensorFlow as we've reported many times before. And I think that business users should pay closer attention because a lot of that uh, investment uh, that has been going into TensorFlow and into TensorFlow-based application framework in a lot of companies, everybody's saying like TensorFlow is more for the enterprise, PyTorch is for scientists mm -hmm. and hobbyists, but uh, they PyTorch won essentially. And now Google is of course trying to kind of have a comeback with Jax, right? Have you tried it? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I mean to, to be fair, I mean, TensorFlow, I think it's, it's still going to be super relevant for the foreseeable future because there's going to be so much legacy code and, and uh, and it's, 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 it's going to be very good. The COBOL of deep learning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it sounds it sounds like that. Uh, but it, indeed, it was super um, interesting to see this transition. I remember, uh, you know, like three or four years ago, PyTorch was still kind of the niche uh, uh, that was dominating in research, but not in not in, in companies. And and you can see how these really translated so, so strongly to um, to uh, to 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 like industry applications of machine learning and and nowadays no one like most people want to um, use uh, PyTorch and when it comes to Jax I heard that uh, Google is gonna move a lot of their their um, you know efforts towards building uh, you know a new um, autograd uh, libraries based on on these uh, Jax and I know that a lot of researchers are very excited about that and if you look at the code that a lot of the um, research coming out of Google Pretty much everything is is Jax based now nowadays. And have it you looks tried, like have you tried no, it? No. I haven't tried it yet. I, no. I was a bit scared, but I, I I definitely should. Yeah, I'm uh -huh. very curious whether it will really catch on in the mainstream. Uh, yeah. but uh, well, it's a, it's a very cool framework. A lot of people are excited about it, Jax. Um, so following up from last uh, month's uh, news, there was this whole riot about uh, GPT-4chan by Yanni Kilcher, who trained uh, a GPT-like model on uh, uh, 4chan, spewing all kinds of uh, uh, toxic language at 4chan. Uh, he deployed it as a bot there uh, and reported about it in a video. The video actually has over 300,000 views. A lot of people accuse him of being clickbaity and uh, just doing it for profits and laughs and not being really ethically responsible. It got a little bit of a um, of a follow on uh, because actually um, the uh, foundational models uh, group at Stanford uh, published this sort of petition for people to sign the condemnant of this experiment and of Yannick's uh, intentions in this. And uh, yeah, it's pretty weird. I, I haven't seen Stanford lately condemning anything else but Yannick. So it must be the worst thing that ever happened. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, it's so... honestly, um, I would I would highly recommend watching that video because it's, it's uh, super interesting. And like you said, it has a, a lot of views and it has got a, gathered a lot of attention. It is clickbaity, but there's nothing on YouTube that's not clickbaity. But I think that it's clickbaity in a, in a worthy sense, in the sense that it's actually um, adds a lot to the discussion of, of um, ethics in, in artificial intelligence and makes it, you know, concrete. And you can see an example of, of what happens when humans and, and, uh, 
and um, and machines interact in a like certainly in a very toxic uh, way. But um, um, I don't know. I, I do feel it 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 had a lot of um, interesting, uh, you know. Yeah. To, like, well, I I, uh, I it also definitely it's uh, it's problematic in many ways. But I think the signing of letters to condemn people who do interesting stuff. Uh, I'm not so sure. I'm a fan of that, but. Uh, yeah. I would not sign it. Um, all right, let's not dwell too long on it. Um, we've also talked many uh, times about the uh, big science workshop from Hugging Face, training this uh, super large model, 176 mm -hmm. billion parameter GPT-3 like model. Nobody uh, condemns them. Uh, they also did an extremely good job in like cleaning the data and being very open about everything. Yeah, I mean, but, yeah. You know, it's, a, it's a model with which could also be used in many unpredictable ways. But now it's done. Yeah, well, actually, funny, funny enough, uh, apparently they they reached their target of training uh, budget a bit earlier. So they uh, mentioned that they were gonna continue training the model for a few days. Um, but yeah, I think that. Uh, you know, like the community is super excited about this effort. And I think that so much, um, you know, like there's so much uh, insight that has already come out of that uh, from this effort and the fact that they're putting a lot of effort in like uh, how they treat the data, how they share that with the community in documenting everything and, and that the language, the, the, this model is also multilingual. Um, I'm super, super excited to see the, the research papers that come out of this and, and to try out this, this model. Yeah, and the checkpoints are already uh, available for yeah, uh, researchers. Uh, they have been also during the training process. Uh, I met uh, Thomas Wolf from Hugging Face uh, last week. I said, well, okay, where's the launch party? You know, you know, you know I like uh, parties to celebrate things. So uh, uh, he said he would think about it. So there will be yeah. some sort of official, uh, official launch uh, thing uh, by Hugging Face of, of this um, major milestone in open source um, um, uh, large language models. They did get scooped a little bit by uh, by Meta, by the- Yeah, yeah like last month, they, they um, already open sourced uh, their model, but- Yeah, yeah the more the merrier. Uh, and absolutely, I think absolutely. super cool initiative and uh, applause for Hugging Face for pulling this through and, and the large community, and, of, and just, not just Hugging Face, right? So it was a community of about a thousand people who contributed. Yeah. And just to add a caveat to that, um, they didn't fully get scooped uh, by Meta because the Meta um, model they open sourced is pretty much a replication of GPT-3, so it's monolingual, for not, instance. Not, not multilingual, not multitask, yeah, and, and all yeah, that. Yeah, and and this this model uh, it's it's uh, multilingual, so I think that that's there's a lot of interesting uh, phenomena that that you know you can uh, investigate uh, thanks to that. And I, I really appreciate as a non-native English speaker that um, they would include um, a, like a lot of language. I don't know on top of my head. I don't, I, 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 they don't have Dutch. They, they, <laughs> they forgot to include Dutch, I think. Uh. But I'm not sure, but uh, I think, uh, um, yeah, no Dutch, sorry. Um, all right, so uh, more news, kind of industry news. Uh, there's a paper, um, I was surprised actually um, that there is a paper because uh, it's from Apple. Um, so Apple is not known all that much for publishing in the open literature. They do sometimes, but um, mm -hmm. uh, this is a very cool result. Um, yeah. So uh, inference time on image recognition under one millisecond on a mobile phone. Wow. One millisecond. That means you can recognize a thousand images per second. Yeah. On a mobile phone. That, that's pretty insane it, it's it's so interesting i mean uh, it, it's so cool that they have managed to do this i guess it's it's uh, a lot of it is thanks to their you know very strong vertical integration of designing from the chip to the yeah there, there's um, the, neural chip. Of, the neural yeah, exactly, chip the iphone is actually seems to be very powerful because in the paper you can read the benchmarking results on a cpu and it's about 20 times slower than on the phone yeah so, so that's yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's really cool, is what you get, yeah. So AI on the uh, Edge device, a major breakthrough, um, I think open sourced, partially at least. Um, yeah, this is an interesting one. Oh, so many models coming out, we, we didn't actually put it in our, in, in our uh, Trends in AI mm -hmm. uh, uh, top 10 papers list. It would have been any time in the past year, it would have made the list, right? Yeah, absolutely. But there's was so much other stuff, and 
you know, quite interestingly, this didn't uh, make so much buzz, right? Um, so I, what is this actually? Just was discussed. Well, it's another, yet another uh, text to image generation model. Um, it beats um, Imogen, right? Last month, yeah. Imogen, uh, Google came with Imogen. And it was like super uh, hot and all these nice images and uh, and uh, yeah. And Imogen uh, beat Dali too, actually, on yeah. on 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 the their uh, valuation metric, which yeah. is not necessarily correlates hundred percent with with what humans would judge. But so actually, yeah. this model uh, is the pathways uh, uh, pathways um, text to image generation model. So mm -hmm. it's kind of uh, built on top of uh, the, the the Palm uh, framework. It's a very large model. Um, it makes use of this pathways uh, architecture mm -hmm. uh, that allows sort of multi um, uh, TPU cluster, uh, la very uh, large models to be trained. It's not so large. It's 20 billion parameters. And this kind of goes back to um, Dali one, I think. With yeah, this. yeah. So very interestingly, they do they do image generation by uh, auto regressive generation of uh, image patches, which is yeah. what what Dali one uh, used to do. It was like a just a monolithic uh, transformer that outputs um, basically one image patch at a, at a time, uh, which is just a discrete token. Uh, yeah. So it doesn't use diffusion models at all, uh, unlike Imogen and Dali two. Yeah, there's there's some elements that are also sim similar to Imogen in that they they generate this sort of lower resolution image and then um, sort of uh, 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 yeah. make the high resolution from that by yeah. uh, by a model, and uh, so the super resolution module. But would you believe that <laughs> this is a little snippet in the paper? Like, why does Google make two of these models and release them within like few weeks of each other? Why? Yeah, uh, it, it does sound like, like they, they weren't, there was not a lot of communication going on. They didn't know they were working on it, apparently. Yeah. I, don't, I, I don't know. I uh, haven't asked. Uh, yeah. Jonathan Ho was actually last week in Amsterdam presenting the Imogen paper, which is a very cool presentation. Mm -hmm. He did not mention this one, I think. Uh, so, yeah, in yeah. the paper, it does say they talked, but uh, sharing their near complete re results. So that means that they worked on it for like, they should talk more. Yeah. You know, maybe get some sort of good collaboration tool or, uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, interesting. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it was interesting that Jonathan Howe actually uh, in the in the Imogen presentation did not do a live demo. Uh, and I think DALI Mini, many people have been playing with DALI uh, 2 Mini. Uh, yeah. But also, party does not release uh, a, a, a interactive demo, and I think the reason is really this, and it was noted on on Twitter that a lot of these data sets, that uh, multimodal data sets that these models are trained on, including this super uh, large Lion data set, which now has five billion images in the latest version, they have some problems. And it's uh, there's this paper. It's uh, from October last year that goes into this. And it, uh, yeah, I don't want to go too deeply, but if you're interested in like uh, um, some of the problematic uh, stuff in in this and other multimodal data sets, uh, check this paper: multimodal data sets, misogyny, pornography, and malignant stereotypes. Basically, if you type the name of any sort of ethnic origin or country you don't really get the touristic images. 90% of the internet is filled with porn. So go figure. No matter how much filtering you do, it's going to be there. <laughs> so uh, I think- Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's going to be interesting to see how how uh, these companies uh, try to make a consum like something that's consumer grade uh, product out of this, right? Because these problems are- yeah. Going to be hard to solve. Um, um, I, I think I you notice that uh, all the examples, and this is actually official company policy at both OpenAI and Google, that they're not going to do any images which have faces of real people or even like. Oh. Uh, actually, right? I, I I didn't I didn't know that. Yeah. So why all these images are like a little bit uh, animated movie like is uh, because of mm -hmm. this policy. So you cannot ask like, um, show me yeah. the picture of uh, Putin who does. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Oh. All right. Um, 
Yeah, so that's kind of for an overview of the news. Last month, we were also at Berlin Buzzwords. It's more kind of the industry conference on um, on um, uh, search and NLP and large data engineering. Uh, it was a super nice to be in Berlin in person. Um, lots of great talks. Uh, uh, what you can say is that really the sort of transformer powered neural search is, is the big thing in search, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Lucene has it now. Uh, Elastic and Solar pulled it through. Vespa already had it. There's tons of startups like WeV8 and Gina and Pinecone and uh, Quadrant and what have you. And uh, they, yeah, they're all presented there. It was a great, great show. Uh, you, uh, if you missed going to Berlin, uh, all the talks are live on YouTube uh, or are recorded on YouTube, so you can watch all the talks. Uh, highly recommended. The, uh, especially the uh, Yo Bergam from from uh, Vespa Semantic Search Broken Promises was a great talk. Um, all right, and last month we, was also CVPR, uh, the large computer vision uh, annual global gathering. It was in New Orleans. I would have wished to go so much, but there's only so much travel you can do. And um, yeah, CVPR was 2,600 papers. This year, 2,600 papers. Wow, yeah, we, have, we have them in Zeta Alpha, of course. We try to pick out a few nice ones. Um, this is a real gem. Um, sub word level lip reading with visual attention. It's not in uh, our monthly blog, but um, if you're uh, interested in cool new stuff, you should definitely check this out. Note also that this is not by one of the big tech lab. It's uh, from the University of Oxford. Um, and uh, the group of Andrew Zisserman and his uh, students, they uh, built this model for um, uh, kind of syllable level um, lip reading. So they, they really uh, have this sort of novel architecture with attention for the image, and then they could do lip, lip reading. And it's a very cool um, architecture. And what's more, they actually, um, uh, beat all existing uh, state of the art on lip reading, but they even beat some models on speech recognition, oh, which wow. have the audio. That's pretty cool. That's very interesting, yeah. Yeah. So check it out. And uh, another paper which was uh, uh, making, uh, getting some, quite some attention at CVPR was a self-driving car, autonomous vehicle, um, a uh, paper called learning from all vehicles which is very cool like um, it actually learns from the data streams of multiple cars at the same time and uh, this paper was already at new Rips in the uh, autonomous driving workshop and won best paper award there uh, and it actually captured state of the art on the carla benchmark which is a simulated driving benchmark uh, but actually at the time of cvpr I looked at the benchmark. Do like, do they still have it? Because that's what what they report in the CVPR paper. And I looked at the benchmark, and they were like trounced. There's this paper called TCP, uh, Trajectory Guided Control Prediction for End-to-End -end Autonomous Driving, and they completely smashed their uh, driving score from going from 62 to 75. Uh, and in particular, they have zero collisions with, with pedestrians. I think that's very good. <laughs> that, yeah, that sounds pretty important. It's a simulated uh, <laughs> thing. And it's, it's a cool idea of having like a, a dual route approach. It's, it's without LiDAR, I think only camera. And um, it's open source as well. It's from, um, it's from the Shanghai AI University. Uh, and um, and uh, I think I looked it up. Uh, uh, yeah, it's a very strong self-driving car group there. All right. Um, so, yeah, how do we know all this stuff? A uh, little break for our own platform. Uh, so for those of us who haven't heard yet, uh, we are Zera Alpha from Amsterdam, and we are a smarter way to discover and organize knowledge for AI and data science teams and be in the know on what's going on in all the recent research. So we basically capture all uh, archive and conference and, uh, and all the blogs and, and GitHub readmes and everything 
and uh, uh, organize it using a state-of-the-art neural search, uh, make it more discoverable uh, through things like um, visualization, find similar what's trending on social media, code popularity, allow you to organize all these projects in personalized collections and tags. Then because you have these, uh, these tags um, and we allow you also to read the documents and take notes and, uh, you know, um, uh, write stuff about these papers and share it with your colleagues. Uh, because we, we do that, we get to know what you're interested in and we can kind of filter the news for you, basically. That's what we're also doing with this webinar. Uh, Sergi, yeah, I think it's your number one tool to actually compile yeah. monthly list. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's my, my, my uh, number one tool to, um, to do my work and, and uh, you know, sort of like find the relevant literature that uh, we should be talking about. Yeah, so whoever uh, said um, uh, end of last year that they, their group should still be using TensorFlow, maybe you should have used Zeta Alpha to find out. But um, yeah, just a few uh, notable features we recently launched. So uh, one is here from a paper we're going to talk about uh, a little bit more, a lot more, uh, is the just uh, breaking news from Meta, uh, no language left behind. They... Um, they launched this huge open source machine translation system for more than 200 languages. You see how you can read it in Zeta Alpha and take your notes and annotate, take, take uh, uh, capture images and write notes on them. And then when you write these notes, you can actually search with those notes using um, neural search, uh, the kind of contextual lookup on any snippet of text. Uh, that's pretty handy. Mm -hmm. or finding related work and it's important to find related work uh, but we have new stuff coming as well and um, uh, that's uh, all of science in your pocket why do you need all of science well it's nice if you um, kind of are right we are a vertical uh, specialized search engine for ai and data science papers so if you're searching for something like bert you really want kind of to find the BERT paper, right? Or information about BERT. And if you um, look in a in some general uh, academic search engine, you might find things like people called BERT or other you know, chemical substances called BERT. Uh, so that's an advantage of being vertically specialized. But what if you are uh, looking into something which is not in AI and data science, you're working in an adjacent field like material science or pharma or um, you know medical imaging or um, uh, uh, something else like biology and you're interested to find information on jellyfish eyes well that's a very cool neural system uh, but ai literature does not have a lot of information on it so we now have this um, uh, federated search system where you can search also in some other search engines that have all the literature, like Google Scholar or Semantic Scholar and others. And um, you can find papers in Nature or Elsevier and all that stuff. So that's coming out soon, uh, hopefully still in July. Um, so Sergi, take it away. What's, yeah, sure. What's um, for July? Yeah, so now we can, we're going to talk about the, the selection of uh, 10 papers that I did. You can uh, check out the, um, um, the, the blog post that I wrote on our, on our website. Uh, like I said before, I feel like this month was especially hard to, to, pick, uh, uh, to pick like the 10 papers because a lot of, also a lot of the big labs, uh, you know, like OpenAI, Meta, Google, uh, DeepMind released a lot of uh, kind of blockbuster uh, type of papers that we would we normally uh, um, we normally pick, uh, but this time we had to leave some some of them out. Um, but yeah, like a lot of a lot of uh, interesting stuff. Um, so like, yeah. it's like the major film studios, right? They release their blockbusters either before the Christmas season or the kind of yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So spring, <laughs> and then you have Batman and and, and Spider Man and the Avengers, and so yeah. it felt a little bit like that. And, um, exactly exactly um so shall should we dive into it into yeah it? so where are the interesting indie uh small indie productions <laughs> oh that's not this one no not so this far. one no so what, what what is the no language left behind 
well, it's a big claim, right? No language left behind. Well, um, let, let's talk about what it is. So um, Meta, um, Wednesday evening, last Wednesday evening um, on uh, uh, 6th of July, um, announced this major um, uh, project that they've been working on for a long time already. A large group of people at Meta um, uh, headed among others by, uh, I think, Angela Fund. She was one of the, 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 the main scientists in the, at Meta in the project, but also a couple of uh, uh, very well-known machine translation um, researchers in, uh, in academia, like uh, uh, Philip Kern and um, uh, many others, um, and basically they kind of very significantly moved the needle on uh, machine translation, especially for low resource uh, languages. So mm. they built this single model um, that basically um, very large, um, uh, sparse uh, mixture of experts model with lots of parameters, I think 54 billion parameters. Yeah. which does 200 languages at the same time. And mm -hmm. it improves the, 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 it improves, uh, the uh, translation accuracy by 44% on blow score. So yeah, and pretty impressive. Also quite uh, interestingly, they use um, a mixture of experts, uh, um, a type of architecture, right? So out of those 54 billion parameters, not all of them are, are being used at inference at the same time which I think is uh, probably also interesting from the perspective of using these uh, as an actual engine for, for translation. Uh, it probably can be optimized further to, to have a more realistic, uh, you know, um, cost of, of yeah. translation. I mean, it's a huge project. So um, uh, I think we need a lot more than uh, the hour to discuss all the details mm -hmm. of the project. Actually, the paper uh, is one of those papers that I don't call a paper, but a book. It's 190 yeah. pages that <laughs> they, they just released. And a lot of it is about kind of, um, right, how do you get the data to uh, to translate 200 languages? There, Many of these languages don't have a lot of bytex data. Uh, mm -hmm. So they would develop this whole uh, approach. And um, if you want to know about details, it's a really good paper uh, worth reading. Um, it's um, like... Um, like a super good PhD thesis uh, by uh, 20 people, more or less. Uh, so, uh, well, there's a lot of uh, detail they put in, in like actually figuring out uh, what do speakers of these languages need in terms of machine translation? What kind of resources are available? Um, and a um, uh, very central piece of their architecture is this, um, uh, new multilingual uh, sentence embedding model called Laser 3, which basically embeds um, bootstraps embedding for all of these languages and then is able to actually mine in sort of unstructured internet data for potential translations. And that's, that's the, really the core of the work. And then once they collected all of this data and cleaned it, they also looked a lot at uh, like avoiding toxic output. Um, not in a super sophisticated way, I think they just like compiled toxicity list and then did all yeah. this to avoid generating toxic uh, behavior, toxic output, which uh, apparently is a major problem with these kind of models. Mm -hmm. And tons of neat tricks, um, like machine learning tricks to actually uh, all kinds of uh, super nifty tricks uh, about training these kind of models with curriculum learning and dropout schemes and mm -hmm. all kinds of super fancy machine learning stuff. So yeah, uh, and uh, it's a lot better, 44% uh, better on, on average uh, on um, uh, uh, blow score. So I think they go from uh, the previous model which has had 16.7 average to 24 uh, blow score. Uh, so that's about 44% improvement. And I think everybody, uh, at least I was wondering, <laughs> but uh, you know, Google Translate is really good. So how does it compare to Google Translate? And it, and it does uh, comparably, right? Well, they did test that. 
mm -hmm. uh, pretty systematically, and they kind of split it into the the, the uh, high coverage languages, you know, yeah. German and Chinese and English, and the low and very low uh, resource languages. Uh, they actually introduced about seventy languages for which there was no Google Translate or no good version of it. So. Um, yeah, on average, uh, they do uh, comparably to, to Google mm -hmm. Translate. So it's a really state-of-the-art machine translation system, but on the low resource and very low resource, they have a slight edge. So mm -hmm. very good. No, that, that's super cool. And the fact that you can uh, you can actually use it, right? Um, as an yeah, individual. and it's not, not only you can use it, it's already deployed at, uh, at Facebook and uh, at Wikipedia also for like um, mm -hmm. translating Wikipedia articles. And it's open source. And again, we have to applaud Meta uh, for being the most open source friendly uh, big tech uh, lab. Uh, so uh, there's all these data sets, uh, tools to <laughs> mine the internet uh, for training data, recreate the model actually, and, and the full model, the, the 54 billion uh, NLLB 200 model is open source plus a number of uh, distilled uh, smaller variants that you can use to actually run it on a, if yeah. you don't have a, a supercomputer. <laughs> on a reasonable, yeah, machine. Yeah. No, I think that's super, that, that's extremely cool. And I have the impression uh, that um, that Meta open sourcing so much of their stuff is also pushing the, you know, Google, for instance, to to, to be a little bit more open about the, their, you know, trained models, for instance, we're going to comment on that later, but they, they recently also um, open sourced some of their, their work. And I feel like um, that's a very nice um, push. And I, I, I think they need to, I think it's really pushing them because, um, you know, like um, um, what you see with TensorFlow versus PyTorch, you're going to see the same thing with a lot of these other frameworks. Um, and it's not just Meta. Yeah. Actually, Microsoft is also doing a pretty decent job. You know, exactly. Yeah, with the yeah. Google See, Google yeah. was originally sort of the king of open source, but uh, built a lot of their empire on open source. But a lot of their stuff, somebody else needs to recreate Absolutely. to open source it. I think Absolutely. They need more. All right. Um, so, yeah. And uh, we have uh, had the privilege to have a, a, a exclusive uh, sort of behind the scenes interview with Angela Fan, uh, the key research scientist at Meta AI in Paris, who, who um, uh, was uh, the, the key contributor to the, the project. And it's a fascinating uh, story about her uh, kind of background and how she got into machine translation, what motivates her and all, a lot of juicy details about the machine learning tricks that they deployed to yeah. get you can watch that on our YouTube channel. So watch it on the Zeta Alpha YouTube channel. Um, all right. Yeah, this one was also one that uh, was pretty popular. Um, I like so it because open. from not so open AI. Not, from not so open AI, uh, learning to act by watching and labeled online videos. Basically, they they train these model to play Minecraft, which is a very challenging um, game to to learn to play because it involves a lot of the key um, strategies involve long sequences of actions that um, like a lot of current reinforcement learning algorithms would fail to discover on their own. And I really like uh, that we're discussing this right after the No Language Left Behind paper, because I feel like at the core one of, uh, they share a very common um, sort of um, core contribution, which is the fact that they um, find a way to label or automatically label uh, or label very efficiently a lot of data. And um, in the case, in the case, uh, like I was mentioning before, uh, they do um, with the no language left behind. They do this by text mining uh, strategy to find candidate uh, so, um, uh, translations between lower resource languages. Um, um, and in this case, they train a model to uh, that to, basically they train a model that um, if it, like sees video and um, labels what actions are are happening in the in the game. And with that, you can see this in, in, this, uh, in this little figure here. You can see that um, by only collecting 2,000 hours of video uh, gameplay, actually, from, from, um, you know, from players, uh, from human players, um, they train this auxiliary model that uh, bidirectionally labels, uh, labels raw videos with, with, um, 
with action and like key presses and mouse movements. And with that, they are able to crawl a large data set of 70,000 uh, 70, hours of video from, from, I think, YouTube or other sources that is only video. And thanks to this auxiliary model, they can very efficiently and very effectively uh, label a huge data set uh, that then they can train a big model on that. And that performs really, really well. So I, I think that once again, the, the secret is in the data curation and the data labeling and, and like how, how skilled, uh, you know, OpenAI was with generating this, this data set. Uh, and basically they show a bunch of, uh, you know, in a bunch of benchmarks, how um, impressive their um, algorithm is. They first do it on behavioral cloning, which means they train the big model on this big data set uh, to basically given the past, uh, frames and key presses to train what is the you know the key presses and mouse movements that the agent should do and with that it already does very well and then after that they use that uh, model and they train it in a in a reinforcement learning setting where there's an agent that can freely explore the world um, and it very interestingly also this agent that is kind of um, not trained from scratch but trained from a you know from a behavioral cloning method uh, is able to discover a lot of these complex sequences like for instance there's uh, I haven't played Minecraft actually, but apparently building a, a diamond, making a diamond is a big deal. And it involves a lot of very complex, um, you know, finding materials and combining it in, in, um, in special ways. And this is something that uh, uh, like uh, most common reinforcement learning um, algorithms or agents would not discover from scratch. But this model, uh, if, you, if you, you know, bootstrap your reinforcement learning exploration from this uh, model, it, it learns all of these um, very complex uh, skills within the game and this is kind of spear record to get the diamond x i also don't play minecraft but i i understand from uh from the paper and and other places that having a diamond x is like the cool <laughs> thing in minecraft so uh, yeah. exactly exactly that's the that's the crown yeah um this was really interesting you yeah like Open AI uh, 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 released this paper, and then uh, it was actually uh, a week after this paper. Yeah, and this, this paper was a week or two before, right? Yeah. So uh, NVIDIA, together with some universities, released this huge simulation uh, thing for training reinforcement learning with internet scale knowledge of uh, videos and, and text and knowledge bases on Minecraft. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> And they did not know about each other. Yeah, exactly. Right. And, exactly. and actually, like uh, so a week later, uh, the OpenAI paper was published. They could have at least like made the party uh, comment, like we learned about <laughs> yeah. this one week before publication. It's really interesting. It's not cited, so yeah. they might, might not even have discovered it, or they were just. It, it could very well be they were if they upset, were maybe. too busy finalizing their the release. Yeah. Yeah, and. Uh, uh, just want to point out that uh, if you um, if you would have done proper related work search and you you kind of upload the uh, OpenAI video pre-training paper, uh, the Mind Dojo paper from uh, one week earlier uh, does come up in the related search. So yeah, yeah. It's one of and the most similar stuff. Too. So actually, none of these other related works were are cited by the OpenAI paper. Yeah. So. It probably a good uh, check to run the similarity search right before you uh, before you publish your paper yep. <laughs> right um, okay yeah this this also super popular paper right by Jan Lecun I feel like this was not really a surprising um, paper uh, it is basically like the this big overview right from Jan um, on the uh, the path towards human level intelligence or autonomous machine intelligence um, it didn't surprise me a lot because I think that if you have followed him, he has already explained these ideas in many places. So this is kind of more of a place uh, where, where he put everything together. Uh, what do you think about it? And can you give us a, a quick overview, Jakub? Yeah, so first of all, uh, it's kind of um, a little bit like uh, Dali 2 and Imogen and, and Partee and everybody, uh, every one of the Turing Prize winners uh, uh, feels a need to kind of leave their legacy on the future yeah. of, uh, of AI, not just their legacy that they have already done, but kind of look into the future, into the crystal ball. And uh, I really like these papers. So Jeff Hinton had this Glom paper and Joshua mm -hmm. Benjo, the consciousness prior, and 
uh, they're really thinking hard about this stuff like how do we move from this sort of uh, now mainstream deep learning with lots of uh, you know scaling and parameters transformer models to the next level um, yeah. and um, a lot of these papers have a very cognitive science flavor they kind of try to go back to neuroscience um, you know neural networks yeah. are always kind of uh, loosely inspired by the brain uh, this picture here says it all like uh, he he, he does suggest that there are certain modules in the brain which map to these model uh, things. But what is nice is that uh, he does actually kind of um, make it very close to a computationally uh, coherent framework with a fully differentiable models. And the core of the idea is this, that you, from perception, you build up this world model and this world model uh, kind of uh, predicts stuff going on in the world, but not at the pixel level or like the perceptual level, but in, in a late, in a meaningfully organized representational space, a latent space. And it tries to predict all the time what happens. And you can use that model to actually predict like in a generative way, but you can also uh, use that world model uh, at uh, inference time to actually adjust the uh, uh, the uh, sequence of steps taken by some sort of policy uh, to more closely match the predictions of uh, of the world model. So it's a kind of a gradient descent and inference time that that uh, he describes there. Uh, so not training uh, using backprop, but but kind of approximating representations by their at inference time. And uh, yeah, that's a pretty cool idea. And he develops this whole framework, which he calls um, JEPA. Um, and uh, actually the culmination is hierarchical JEPA, which is kind of like you have the plan how to do something at a higher abstraction level. And then the world model kind of makes that work. And at the same time, the lower level motor actions or uh, mm -hmm. other things work. And it's a very cool model. And obviously one of um, Jan uh, LeCun's um, um, uh, obsessions comes through the energy-based models. So he yeah, gets absolutely. contrastive models uh, and he says that they cannot be parameter vision. Uh, you need energy-based models uh, to actually achieve a level of data efficiency uh, that is comparable to human learning. Here in the left-hand side, you see some sort of estimation of when a child learns certain things and the, the no way you can learn this using existing deep learning and yeah it, it's, learning i think it's very interesting that that he's uh, so i mean i feel like he's been kind of banging that drum of the energy based models for for a long time now um but i i don't see that many people talking about it in the broader community as in i mean it, it, it is a i guess a useful um my guess, is that he is right. my guess is that he is right, but my guess is also that the true next uh, generation uh, AI models will not come uh, from either Jan or, uh, or uh, Jeff Hinton or uh, Joshua Benjo uh, or mm -hmm. any of those uh, sort of 60 year old guys, they will actually come from a new generation and I think this paper resonates also very nicely with one of my favorites which is the hierarchical perceiver by Andrew Yegler from DeepMind. And uh, yeah, uh, I mean, I, I definitely agree with that sentiment. I actually reflect uh, on it on, on, the, um, on the blog post. And I mentioned the, the famous Planck's uh, quote of science advances one funeral at, at the time, metaphorically well, speaking, of yeah. course. <laughs> no, no. Because, guys, uh, very but, long life and yeah. lots of good. Uh, no, absolutely, absolutely. But but I, I resonate with your um, core yeah, but there's a that, that, you know, the young... they're also reading these papers and they're getting inspired by them. And this cognitive yeah. science approach is, is very useful. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, all right, evolution through large models. We're a bit short on time, so we're going to go really quickly through these. Um, I really love this paper because uh, it combines ideas from uh, evolutionary algorithms and large language models. I feel like evolutionary algorithms are not super uh, you know, fashionable right now, uh, but basically they they use language models. So one of the big problems of evolutionary algorithms is that the um, their mutation uh, operators are, um, if, if they're very express, if they're very, uh, you know, um, random, and they try to explore a whole space of solutions, they're very inefficient. Like imagine you're trying to just like randomly or have a monkey type, uh, you know, a program, it's gonna, it's gonna take a long time to, to, to find it. 
Um, and if you create two narrow mutation operators, you know, it's not going to explore um, you know, the, the space of possible solutions um, very uh, thoroughly. So they use basically a language model to propose candidate solutions um, of, of, uh, in, a, in an evolutionary uh, setting. So the problem they're studying here is genetic programming, in which you start with a with computer program, and then uh, you need to iteratively find better computer programs, like solving bugs or, or improving the, the program. In this case, they use this game called Solar Racers, Solar Racers, which basically the, each Python program creates one of these little animals and that needs to move. Well, not animals, but like a creature. Um, and they train a language model on code diff uh, in, uh, in GitHub, which is super interesting. So you basically get all of the history of files and their commit um, messages. And you train a model to try to auto aggressively predict the next file. So like whatever human will have uh, changed based on the, the commit message. So this uh, language you know, model learns. You know that the commit messages in, on 90% of GitHub is fix something. <laughs> 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 so they do some, uh, yeah, yeah, of course, they do some, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, smart processing of what, what, uh, like, what data they, uh, um, what code diffs and what commits they, they actually use to train. But basically, the idea is that the language model learns to, you know, um, iteratively improve um, a program. Um, and and it, it's really interesting and it, it, it works really well and it has very interesting implications for open-endedness. And I think that this might be a, you know, a very interesting revival of the, of the whole evolutionary algorith uh, algorithms uh, camp. So I'm, I'm looking forward to what you know, follow-up works on that. Totally into evolutionary algorithms in, uh, in the, 90, the 1990s, but uh, the sort of very close to random search part yeah. not going very well so maybe this is uh, indeed a renaissance for them yeah and i think we do need stuff like that also for like architecture search and neural networks and all all kinds of things yeah absolutely um so uh, another another uh, game playing algorithm from DeepMind, i think right yeah and another game changer I'll, i think this is actually a bigger deal uh than um, than the minecraft paper um mm -hmm. I haven't had the chance yet to go through it uh, in detail, uh, but basically DeepMind uh, built this new model called Deep Nash, and it masters the game of Stratego. Uh, Stra Stratego. Um, and um, why is that a big deal? Because it's a it's a, a game with imperfect information, and uh, um, uh, it like. Um, uh, it's much more complicated, obviously, than than Go or something like that, mm -hmm. and it learns it in a similar sort of self-playing uh, way. So it's a it's a big deal for um, reinforcement learning in imperfect games, and life is an imperfect game. So <laughs> maybe it uh, uh, can solve evolutionary uh, problems as well. It could be. I mean, uh, you know, Alpha. Um, uh, I think Alpha Zero includes some evolutionary um, uh, parts in their in their in their search. Uh, and, and yeah. yeah, but definitely a paper that will have impact, and um, and definitely paper worth uh, uh, reading a little bit deeper. Yeah. Also, very uh, quickly, this is super cool paper from Google. Uh, they basically investigate how far you can push quantitative quantitative reasoning. Uh, of large language models, they actually use Palm, so the big uh, five, more than 500 billion parameter models uh, on these, and they basically uh, fine tune it using a lot of uh, math uh, stuff. So, like, they I think that they use a lot of archive papers and math uh, websites. Um, they basically just keep the la the LaTeX, uh, you know, text, and they let the model. Uh, you know, learn on, on that. And if you couple that with advanced prompting, something that we have talked about before, like a chain of thought prompting, um, something that's called a scratch, uh, scratch pad uh, prompting. And then you also do like some inference techniques, like majority voting, like like generating a bunch of- hey, Sorry, they, they, gener they, they don't like sample uh, solutions only, but they like majority vote over many yeah. different uh, solutions. Exactly, like they generate a bunch of solutions and uh, the numerical sort of solution that uh, is most common, they pick one of those solutions as the final. So, I mean, there's a lot of kind of these kind of tricks that you would say, okay, that's kind of a bit, it's almost cheating for, for like to do all of those things, but very interestingly, um, it, 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 it improves massively the performance of quanti quantitative reasoning. And I think that this speaks a little bit, you know, there's a lot of the, the criticisms of the, like the critics um, of large language models like to point out that the reasoning is not 
is not uh, robust and that it, it doesn't solve a lot of these things. But it turns out that when you train with the right data and with the right techniques, it does get much better. I mean, it's not perfect. I'm not claiming that this is like the solution, but it 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 certainly keeps getting get, getting better. So um, that's the power of good engineers. Name your problem and we'll, we'll solve it. And this yeah. this, this different yeah, yeah. really like uh, like before the 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 gray bars is like it was not it was it was not doing any making any sense and I was doing very well. So a yeah. uh, yeah, big breakthrough also I think. This. Yeah. So um, I think we have to. Yeah, uh, we have to wrap up diffusion language models. Uh, I like to highlight diffusion is is kind of the in the past year it's popping up everywhere. Uh, I think it's kind of it's it's here to stay and now it's applied to to text generation. Uh, so I'm I'm sure diffusion will find its way to many many more applications in the machine learning world. Yeah. Um, so um, yeah, this is also I think a very interesting paper where. Um, uh, which which looks at the problem that you know like you don't want to retrain your whole network if you just want to um, alter a few facts that are stored in it, right? Yeah, especially in a, if you want to make inferences about the world that's changing very often. Um, so GPT three still does not know about COVID, uh, but uh, maybe I'm pretty sure that their API they they retrained uh, with some uh, newer data, but the original one certainly doesn't. Yeah. So this paper uh, proposes a solution uh, is from Stanford, um, and um, this is some very cool video. What yeah, is this? This, I, this is such a such a cool uh, um, paper. So basically, they use uh, radiance uh, neural radiance fields, which is this technique to use neural networks to render newer views of a three D scene. Um, to and so they combine that with a with a style transfer type of uh, type of objective, so that they they enable um, you know the generation of three D views of um, objects in, in arbitrary artistic styles, uh, which is super cool. I mean, I think that artistically this, um, I don't know, I mean, if if the if Mark Zuckerberg's uh, dream of the, um, the whole metaverse ever comes through, um, I feel like this kind of stuff uh, can like become such a, a cool um, application. And I mean, also in, in the world of video games and stuff like that. But if you go to the demo page, I highly recommend going to the demo page. You can see a bunch of examples. Um, and it's just extremely cool. I mean, I don't know how how much of real applications you can find for this, but it's just amazing. Well, a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, uh, Hisko, he's a, he's an animator. He did this series on, um, uh, on Amazon Prime called Undone. And they actually like uh, manually trace uh, actors who are, you know, uh, playing and stuff and then do oil painting in the background. Mm -hmm. I think you should read this paper. Uh, Absolutely, yeah. Make things a lot easier. Yeah, totally. It's a very nice series, by the way, Undone on Amazon Prime. Uh, this is kind of a little bit more in our uh, yeah. side of the ballpark, rural search. Yeah, this is kind of uh, if you have if you know about the differentiable search index paper that we have highlighted and talked about in the podcast before, it's this pretty much new uh, search paradigm where a whole corpus uh, kind of is memorized into the parameters of a network, and then a network auto aggressively kind of outputs document IDs given a query. So mm -hmm. uh, this paper basically kind of builds on that and pushes it further, uh, uh, pretty much by doing query expansion, like they they do like um, uh, doc to query and they train it on more data, and it works amazingly. I mean, the... Uh, well, 88%, that's, yeah. that's nasty. <laughs> that's, the, the, so, so the caveat here is that um, they're comparing here against models that were not trained on NQ320, so it's kind of unfair. Uh, but if you look at the DSI versus this neural corpus indexer, only by doing this query expansion, you get a massive um, improvement in performance, uh, which is super interesting. And I think that these... Kind of technique uh, will produce a lot of. Is this results. like uh, what we call zero shot learning by training on the test set? <laughs> I uh, I mean, it's kind of. Um, they do look at the, at the at the in domain test data. Yeah, yeah, they, they do look in the, in the in domain, but not at the not at the not test query, right? Not because the, the information retrieval, you like the. Yeah, not at the labels. You look at the whole corpus, but not the. Um, not yeah, exactly. You look at the whole corpus, but not at the test. Uh, yeah. but still like you don't let bm25 calculate the weights on the test data either right no 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 so like i said it's a bit unfair comparison 
but it's a very still very interesting um, application of yeah. this information. One more on on neural search. I saw this paper called um, I think Sim LM, uh, mm -hmm. and it just came out also this week, and they trounced NC and and Colbert and um, very good score on MS Marco with uh, with dense retrieval. Sim LM. We don't have a slide for it. Yeah. Uh, so just wrapping up, uh, don't have time to talk about this one anymore, but we, we've talked a lot about retrieval augmented uh, models for machine translation, language models, um, uh, etc. Uh, any good model is bound to be retrieval augmented in the future. And this was the first one which I saw in, um, in computer vision. So kind of the classical like store you're embedding in, in uh, fast nearest neighbor search and then it does very well on the low frequency classes on ImageNet or they, they didn't test it on ImageNet, I think. They tested exactly. it on some uh, other data sets, but um, kind of the long tail phenomena, of course, you have to store the long tail to do well on it. Uh, it's coming back the idea. And on what's on GitHub, we have to wrap up. It's Yeah, uh, we're just highlighting. Yeah. This Google Research C5X uh, release, where you can uh, find a lot of their uh, pre-trained models. There's the this DoY Python library that is uh, pretty, um, you know, um, uh, to do a causal inference that lets you do like uh, set up uh, like graphical models for causal inference and do machine learning and and um, and work with that. That is 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 really nice. And then there's this uh, OpenFold, which is an open source implementation of the AlphaFold too. Um, that you can use and train and and do inference with. Um, so if you're if you're working in that space, certainly check that out. And don't download the uh, 1.6 trillion parameter switch C model on your phone by accident from GitHub. That could take a good idea. No. Um, <laughs> but it's great great that they open sourced it actually. Yeah. So kudos for Google on becoming more open. Um, and uh, that's it for this uh, July uh, Trends in AI. Um, if you want to kind of uh, explore and discover more, uh, try out our uh, platform. Uh, it has lots of cool stuff and allows you to actually do a webinar like this yourself on any topic that you are interested in. Uh, and uh, that's it. And looking forward just a little bit. So there's ICML coming up in the... Um, in, um, a little bit more than a week um, uh, in in Baltimore. Um, that's a big conference. Uh, I hope I'm going to SIGIR in Madrid. If the airplanes in Europe uh, uh, serve us yeah. well, that seems to be a big problem. So I hope I get there. Uh, and there's NACL also next week in, uh, in Seattle, big uh, ACL conference for North America. So we're going to be reporting on some of the cool stuff that we find there and um yeah next uh, month i'm on vacation but you're gonna do it yeah yeah i'm gonna we're gonna uh, figure something out um so oh, I, I was Marty is back. Uh, yeah i'll certainly see you next month yeah and uh, so i'm at science park today save the date 9th september we are organizing something uh cool in amsterdam at science park uh, yeah. something super excited like, super excited work, about workshop uh, a party uh, who knows stay super tuned. excited about doing something in, in person and if you're really bored out of your mind in the summer vacation uh try uh word dolly it's pretty nice it's That's the prompt. Fun. what's the prompt <laughs> very fun all right thank you uh, everyone for um for joining us uh i'll see you again the next month and have a very nice uh weekend